will know mine. The days of peace. The year is 1072 after the Exodus. It is a time of civil war for the dwarves, those of Deljamor versus their xenophobic cousins, the Stone Summit. During a hazardous trip through the northern Shiver Peaks, the Ascalonian Prince Rurik lost his life to Dagnar Stonepate, leader of the Stone Summit. In the lands of Kryta, the oppressive White Mantle maintain control over the land, they are led by Confessor Dorian and his Mossart masters. A rebel force, the Shining Blade, have been betrayed by one of their own. Assisted by Vizier Kilbron, their forces are scattered to the southern Shiver Peaks, hotly pursued by their aggressors. Now both the War of the Dwarves and the War of the Mossart and Man collide, as was told in the concluding chapters of the Flameseeker prophecies. The peaks and valleys of the Shiver Peaks will be painted in blood. Not even death will save you from my wrath. If you will allow me this indulgence, King Ironhammer, perhaps the Confessor can still be of some use to us. Never give me the opportunity for revenge! This is just as it was written in the Flame Seeker Prophecies. An opening will be given to the disciples of the Unseen. The peaks and valleys of the Shiver Peaks will be painted in blood. At this time, the Ascendants will rise, and the way to the door will be clear. The time of our judgment is near. We must prepare. Today's was a great victory, but now your true challenge begins. You must go to the Ring of Fire Island chain. In the caldera of the largest volcano, you will find the power you need. The Ring of Fire? A more treacherous land interior there is not. True enough, but that is where we will find the door of Komali. Behind it lies the secret to defeating the Mursat. You're a brave lot, but you'll not make it past the beachhead. Not without some dwarven help. I will go with them. Breknar, do you know what you are saying? Yes, brother. A mission to the Ring of Fire would be suicide. Then may we meet each other in the afterlife. Through this portal awaits your destiny. Do not let it linger. Seize that which you were born to do. Until we are reunited in the Great Forge. Go with honor, my brother. Fight bravely in the name of Deldramor.
And so, in what turned out to be quite typical prophecies fashion, wow, the uh, should like chest there moved. We end up going to another area of the world. We end up going to the Fire Island chain to fulfill the Flame Seeker prophecies. Who specifically the Flame Seeker is at this point is a little vague, but that's the idea, guys. That's where the story was. Hopefully, everything makes sense now. When we came to the Fire Island chain and why we came to the Fire Island chain way back before. Obviously, our reasons in Guild Wars 2 are very different. Today, I want to talk to you about the old place, what it once upon a time was, and uh, what maybe we can infer about the next batch of content going into Guild Wars 2 because of it. We did a little bit of a tour like this before Heart of Thorns came out, where we went into the Goomba Jungle, and well, the little tour we'll do this time is going to be much shorter, probably just two videos or so, rather than however many the previous one was, because while the Maguma Jungle in Guild Wars 1 was fairly expansive, as you can see, lots of stuff going on, the Fire Island change really small. It has one outpost, three missions, and an explorable map. That's it. So what I'm going to do is talk to you guys as much as I possibly can about all these places. So you notice this is where we load in. Uh, we're in a place actually called the Ember Light Camp. And uh, this is the only outpost on the Fire Island chain. You may already recognize the name of that. It sounds like the name of the map we're going to in Guild Wars 2. Two. Now, that's already quite interesting because the trailer seems to show some areas very far away from the Ember Light Camp that we'll get to later. But uh, it seems Ember Bay is being named maybe after this. Maybe this little bit of water here is the Ember Bay. But uh, so let's have a bit of a read, right? Ember Light Camp, just on the edge of the Ring of Fire. The Ember Light Camp was established by a group of sailors whose Corsair was shipwrecked here during a terrible storm. There is little left today of the original camp except the story of the men who lived to tell the tale. The idea is really that there's basically no natural ports on this entire island chain. It's incredibly inhospitable and uh, yeah, you're kind of legendary if you came here and you survived, which is what you do in Guild Wars 1. Uh, funnily, the one thing that kind of contradicts this and happened a lot of the time in Guild Wars 1 are the Junolai agents. So those Guild Wars 2 players might not really be too familiar with who these guys are. This was like the banking system. This is like the Guild Wars 1 black line tr uh, company, I guess. Uh, except they're from Canther and they had agents everywhere. What it, ArenaNet eventually did, like when you got to desolate areas in, say, Alona and so forth, and you got into the Realm of Torment, they stopped having the agents around, they just had chests. So it was just the utility, and there was no magical reason why Junolai agents had made it to these arse ends of the planet. But for our purposes on the Fire Island chain, apparently the Junolai agents have made it here too, so very good of them, I suppose. This is always an interesting view to me, because you get to see some of the, like, weirdest views out. Like, this is the most southern sea you will ever see in, in Guild Wars, right? Like, just looking down from there. Anyway, so, uh, what have we got to talk about? Well, there is a primary quest that we can grab right here. I'm gonna wait a second, though. Uh, that's the only quest on the Fire Island chain. It's given to you by this character here called Shadow and her pet, Carlotta. Um, but we won't talk about that. We've got a cool little dock over here. Uh, and really very little else going on. There's a skills vendor. This guy actually was the last skills vendor in the game and did have unique skills that you couldn't get anywhere else as far as I remember unless you unlocked them and got them through other means in later years. So you did find a lot of players wanted to get here and I cannot stress that enough guys. For the elite skills that exist here, for uh, even just the regular skills that you could buy from DAC, Players wanted the Fire Island chain, and at the original release of Prophecies, that was a hard thing to get to. Why? Because probably one of the hardest missions in the entire game was Thunderhead Keep, and you had to complete Thunderhead Keep. The only way to get here is through the portal at the end of Thunderhead Keep, as you saw in those cutscenes, and then it would take you all the way over here magically. There are no other routes in, and um, yeah, the original balance, that that massive long fort defense, which now is just tedious and boring, was a, was a pretty tough thing. So you've got, uh, you've got all your henchmen here. At this point in the game, I think it had happened already actually, uh, the henchmen turn into the main characters for the story. So Sin, Devonna, Eve, Aiden, and then a couple of others. Menlo, Lena, Little Tom, and Dunham get thrown in there as well for a bit of balance. But those are the guys that appear on the trailer. If you guys check it out, this was the original trailer for Prophecies. It does depict the Fire Island chain in various elements, but none of this is of any lore consequence. So I don't want to talk about the trailer for too much. There'll be a link in the description if you want to watch the full thing. Uh, but it kind of suggests stuff about the story that never ended up happening, okay? That trailer does show some of the locations, but the enemies they're fighting, why they're fighting the enemies, is that trailer really depicting this last chapter I'm about to show you in these videos? I'm really not so sure. Alright, so let's go on through. Let's go out into the first explorable area. And I've got quite a, a lot of things that I want to talk to you guys about out here. So this place is called Perdition 
Rock, okay? Now, Perdition Rock, uh, already Perdition, it's, it's a reference to, like, Christian theology. A state of eternal punishment and damnation into which a sinful and unrepentant person passes after death. Alright, so it's got a bit of a fancy name. You'll see here that there's a ton of enemies out in front of us. That's basically what I want to talk to you guys about here, because really, Perdition Rock doesn't have too much else going on. So we're going to run around the map. Uh, it's this huge chunk over here. And we're going to see what we can find. Now, first of all, are these skulls all over the place. Now, in the most recent development trailer video thing that ArenaNet put out, they talked a lot about uh, these and how they liked them being all metal and stuff. I actually made a mistake in a recent video, as was pointed out in the comments to me. I thought there was no law on these skulls whatsoever. Turns out, in one of the most obscure places you can find law, in my opinion, the hand, uh, the, the actual physically printed manuscript for prophecies actually does reference in about two sentences these skulls and suggests that they come from some twisted evil in the land but there's nothing more than that but there is a bit of lore and i never realized that so that's pretty cool and again hopefully guild wars 2 goes into them a bit more but they are bloody everywhere aren't they they're not really enemies you don't really interact or fight with them the guys you're going to interact or fight with are out here. A couple of uh, other things to talk about with Perdition Rock before we go in. This place is hard. This is one of the hardest places for the original release of the game. Not necessarily the hardest. Like I said, Thunderhead Keep was hard. Some of the end missions that they eventually added, like the Titan Quest and stuff, were quite hard as well. But, you know, like as you walk out of Perdition Rock here... I did a video on Wooden Potatoes 2 talking about this. These Hydra and things that attack you, there's loads of patrols that all cross and intersect with one another. They were hard to kill, they were dangerous, there are little pop-ups of ghosts and things that can appear all around you. And generally, you're going to have a really bad time here, okay? So, uh, my build comp is pretty ridiculous and will just blow everything up really, really, really fast. But that's not exactly... Uh, the point. These things are really dangerous and for a long time entering Perdition Rock with all these monsters all over us here, you can already see my party's taking a bit of pressure, uh, was, was a worrying prospect, okay? So everything you're about to see, this was like the hard stuff, alright? Let's just be clear about that. And the monsters we're fighting are pretty interesting at that as well in that many of them are really rare. So let's start talking about them. What did we kill here? We killed some giant, monstrous looking, undead, horrible things. And we killed some Hydra. So, uh, oh, and here's a ghost, a phantom. All right, so first of all, I'll just explain. There are Massar on this map, okay? There are Massar all over the Fire Island chain. We will get to seeing them. Uh, I'm going to talk about those a little bit later, though, because they dominate most of the missions. Let's talk about just the regular things that live here. Some of the boring stuff, we've got Etins. You guys in Guild Wars 2 should be more than familiar with Etins. Etins aren't really anything that interesting. They make sense here. They were igneous Etins that you find here uh, in the Fire Island chain. Hopefully, I can show them to you at some point. We'll kill some more of these flesh golems over here first. So you had Etins. You've also got Drakes. I mean, what better type of a creature to have, really, than Drakes on a place like this? Again, not too uh, interesting, just fiery creatures. Now, there are creatures called Driders. Now, here's a Drider over here. I'm going to let it just wail on me and not have my team run over with me here, just so you guys can see. These are like spider-like. They're supposed to be inspired by Lovecraftian kind of themes and ideas. Uh, and actually, the Driders, there's a lot of different varieties of them, but they were originally made for the Maguma jungle in Guild Wars 1, but in the end were never used in the Maguma jungle. They were instead this rare enemy that only got used in a very uh, certain few small places. So, like, there's a couple of small spawns of Driders in the northern Shiver Peaks, for example. There are a couple of spawns in the, uh, in the mists. There are a couple in the depths of Tyria, so they've got a, a good spread, but really they're not in many places. That's about it, except for here, the Fire Island chain, where many rare and dangerous and monstrous things come to uh, call their home. So the Driders um, do have one interesting thing. There's no real lore or anything about where they came from. Uh, or what they're doing, or why they don't appear in Guild Wars 2, as they don't, by the way. There's not a single Drider in anywhere in Guild Wars 2. But, on the other hand, there is something interesting you can think about. And that's that, as we all know, hopefully, on the Fire Island chain, there is a portal to the Mists, okay? Uh, the Realm of Torment, specifically. And on the other side of that portal, at the door of Kamali, there were some creatures called the Guardians of Kamali. Big bosses at the end of one of the hardest areas of the game. And those bosses, the Guardians of Kamali, were also Driders. So that's quite curious, but there's really nothing else to be said for them. Do I think that just because they're here in the Fire Island chain in Guild Wars 1, that means that the Guild Wars 2 updates will contain them as well? Well, I'm not so sure. Here's an Igneous set, and you might not see him because my guys might blow him up. There you go. He's all the way over there running away. 
Uh, but there's an Igneous setting. Um, do I think that he'll actually appear in Guild Wars 2? I don't know, because they had other opportunities and other areas to maybe put them in Guild Wars 2. We have sort of been vaguely underground, maybe not fully to the depths, but we've been to places and they haven't appeared there either, so... I don't know about that, guys. Uh, obviously, with the Living World update, the devs are going to be a little bit pushed to try and have as many new creatures go in as possible, and maybe this just isn't the time for the Driders. Uh, the Driders, though, um, are quite similar to the Phantoms. You saw me fight one of those already earlier. Let, let's, let's get exploring a little bit further, shall we? Let's go up this way. Are a little bit similar to the Phantoms. Um, the Phantoms also are a Lovecraftian-inspired uh, type of enemy that you find on the Fire Island chain. As I said, they pop up out of nowhere and attack you. Um, and they also were an enemy that was designed specifically for the Maguma Jungle, which uh, is quite crazy. And they never got used in the Maguma Jungle. But they are here and they're deadly. They're Mesmers that will do lots of disruption tactics and do plenty of damage and interrupts and things to you right when you least expect it. So you've got to quickly target them down and be careful. In fact, right as you enter this area, Perdition Rock, there are, dry uh, there are uh, phantoms there right away that you have to be very, very cautious of because they can totally mess you up when you're about to fight already a bunch of other really difficult enemies. So you've got phantoms. The idea of there being ghosts on the Fire Island chain isn't too far-fetched. Uh, souls trapped here after they wander here and die. The place has obviously claimed a lot of lives. You've got all these badass lava flows and things everywhere around you. It makes sense. There are ghosts and they've done some of the harder varieties of ghosts that they can. The phantoms. Alright, so let's move on to some other cool stuff. You saw me fighting Hydra. I actually have a lot to say about Hydra and Hydra I'm a huge fan of. I really, really, really enjoy the Hydra. And some people are asking me, why do you care so much about the Hydra? Even, you know, saying stuff like Hail Hydra to me as if I'm uh, it's something to do with the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe. Well, listen, okay? The Hydra were these, like, really badass, high damage elementalists, okay? Now, my team in, in game right now is just interrupting them constantly and killing them down because of power creep over the years and a freaking awesome build that I set up the other day. But they are deadly. They're really dangerous, and you only saw them again in rare places, okay? So, you see them here, you see them in the Crystal Desert, and funnily enough, weirdly, in some areas of Ascalon. And that's really weird, because we've been to those same areas of Ascalon in Guild Wars 2, and there are no sign of the Hydra there, anywhere. So, it seems like the devs maybe just sort of skipped out and they want to do it later. I believe that because they appear in both the Fire Island Chain and the Crystal Desert, and I seriously hope we get the Crystal Desert at some point soon, here we go, we're actually killing a Hydra right now. You won't see him, he was all the, all the way down there near that lava, so it'll be kind of difficult to spot. There's actually a Drake all the way down there as well, he's running up this cliff. Um, I'm kind of hoping that if we get Hydra uh, with the Guild Wars 2 Fire Island chain, maybe we'll see the Crystal Desert come into the game soon. But they've not appeared in any trailers or anything, which is really, really, really unfortunate to me. There isn't too much lore about Hydra, by the way. It's just that they were cool enemies, they were iconic enemies. They're kind of one of those high fantasy things that I think fit really well into Guild Wars. The most lore you could get, and this is pretty cool by the way, is uh, the naming convention for their bosses. So if we find one that's super powerful and we can capture an elite skill from and stuff, which is what a lot of people would explore Perdition Rock to do. You know, they do cartography, they do skill capturing, they'd vanquish it, and one quest, that was it. That was all really you had to do here. Um, now, if you went uh, to a Hydra boss, you would tend to find that their names were really specific. Their names were made up of three individual short words. So, like, the bosses that appear here on the Fire Island chain are called Rowek Quall Maul or Nail Claw Thutin. And what those names are is the name of the boss, collectively, is three individual words that represent each of his three heads. Oh, how cool is that? So I'm looking forward to seeing some Hydra at some point in Guild Wars 2. When I think Fire Island Chain, just by the way, I don't really think Abominations. Hell, I even forgot that these, these crazy fleshy creatures even existed. I don't necessarily even think the typical like Drakes and uh, Etins and things. I don't think the Driders. I think of Hydra. And so it will be a real shame if this Living World update does not contain Hydra to me because they were such a big facet of this region. But hey, who knows? Maybe we'll be perfectly okay. So speaking of abominations, we actually just killed one here. I believe it was called Melandru's Cursed. So uh, these guys are really interesting. Probably the most interesting of all the mobs. These are the last uh, of the creatures I want to talk about for now. 
Uh, that's pretty much everything in Petition Rock anyway, outside of the Massar variants. Um, and one specific very big type of enemy we'll get to later. Uh, which has been appearing in the trailers. Let's talk about the abominations. So these are stupidly rare. I've already said that a few creatures are rare in the Fire Island chain and are appearing here. Abominations take the cake though. Abominations are so rare that really I think what the story's trying to do is set up that the only place you will ever find them on the real Tyria is here on the Fire Island chain. And there really was so little to do on the Fire Island chain for players, you know, just one map, a couple of missions, you go through linear, you're done. Um, a lot of people just sort of walked away from them and never did very much. Abominations appear here, okay? They appear, one of them, sorry, only one, I think, appears in factions, okay? In Cantha, there's a, a side quest you can do where there's a plot to assassinate the Emperor. And what someone's done is they've imported one of these from the Fire Island chain into the city, and it's moving undetected through the gutters in the Undercity, and you've got to go down down there and catch it before it does any harm uh, and it's called like the flame golem or something you've got to kill it right there was one that was imported into there one of these exotic dangerous creatures in Cantha. Uh, these guys that appear in one of the guild halls too but guess what that's the guild hall that's themed to look like the fire island chain and the last place they appear is the underworld for being so rare the funny thing is they do actually get a little bit more story and they are a very unique model they're a very unique they look like they're undead but their mechanics for whether they take double damage from holy damage and stuff is really inconsistent um but what's kind of interesting about these guys is in the underworld one of the reapers there the reaper of the bone pits actually explains their origin Okay, so he says this, he says, Deep inside the bone pits, a magical essence takes hold of the rancid flesh and broken skeletons of those who have travelled through here without success, lifting them once again into a sort of in-between life. They are neither alive nor dead, merely animated piles of human refuse, shambling abominations of what they once were. So the idea is this is just, this is just immaterial objects that have just been clunkily put together that happens to be flesh and bone and stuff. And these are the trapped adventurers and lost souls that die who wander into the underworld, supposedly. Now that's really cool, and I love that story, but it does raise a very big question, doesn't it? Why would the, they be here on the Fire Island chain? Because that doesn't really seem to make much sense. Now your first thought might be, okay, well what if it's because there's a portal to the Realm of Torment here in the Fire Island chain? And they just sort of went through that portal. Maybe they went through that portal before the Massart got here, before Abaddon became active and started manufacturing lots of Titans to come through the portal. And maybe that's the whole story. And that kind of works, right? But then you might realize something. The Realm of Torment is not the Underworld. They're different places entirely. And the portal here goes to the Realm of Torment, not anywhere else. Wow, this is a really bad pool we've got here. This is a lot of drakes. Oh god, we actually had somebody die. And we had a boss, an Elementalist boss. It's okay, we're fine. We're in a very glassy comp to just nuke stuff down. We're good. We're good. We'll res everybody up in an AoE in a second. Unless the only healer reses that I've got are the two people that died. Which would suck. Now there we go. Okay, we're good. So the Realm of Torment is not the Underworld. So how could they have gotten here? Well, the curious thing is actually that the Realm of Torment was said to connect. Here's one of the rarer grassier areas, by the way, on the volcanic islands, which we saw a little bit of in the trailer. Now, the interesting thing is that the Realm of Torment actually connects to the Underworld. At some point it connects. And where is the point that it connects? It connects at the Bone Pits. The Bone Pits being the place that these Flesh Golems supposedly came from. So, maybe there is an answer to it after all. Maybe, maybe that's potluck that that story ends up working out. But perhaps these genuinely are coming from the portal here. And it's just because the Bone Pits connect to the Realm of Torment. And these guys came through. And yeah, maybe it was before the, the Titan became a threat. Before the, um, before the Massart came here and they've just sort of been wandering around. That's kind of my headcanon anyway. Now, uh, one final thing. I have kind of been lying to you just a little bit. I said that the only place these guys appear on Tyria is here on the final chain. That's a lie. There is one other place and it's just like the Hydra. They, for some reason, appear in Ascalon too. In the same areas that the Hydra do. It's kind of curious, right? It kind of seems to me like this is just... These are some of the last ca creatures that ArenaNet were designing towards the end of their development cycle. They wanted to add a couple more Ascalon maps in there, and so they did, and they put the A-bombs out. In fact, were those maps released with the Titan quests? Because that would make a lot of sense. However, what does that mean with the, for the lore? Because we should go that, that layer deeper and wonder about the lore. Well... Maybe, it, it, I believe there actually was said to be a Lake, uh, a Lake Doric, a uh, portal set up by uh, Lord Odrin somewhere around those areas of Ascalon. So maybe that's how they got there. But yeah, that's the Abominations, guys. 
Uh, they appear only here in the final chain and then randomly also in an area of Ascalon and they haven't been anywhere. They're not in any of the trailers. Do I think that they'll be in the next patch? I'm not sure. Um, actually, one final thing as well is that the bosses, the boss variants of them here, like this guy here, are named after the gods. So there's Balthazar's Cursed, who's a warrior. There's Lissa's Cursed, who's a Mesmer. There's Duena's Cursed, who's a monk. There's five of them for each of the five gods that existed at the time of prophecies. An interesting idea then in Guild Wars 2 would be having like a Cormier's Cursed or something. Um, but that also meant, by the way, because there were only five gods but six classes at the launch of Guild Wars 2, you actually had... Uh, kind of a weird situation where there is no elementalist golem boss here at all. Uh, but yeah, I guess it's not really a very, very big deal. And that's the abominations, guys. Stupidly rare. I reckon most of you guys, even if you've played Guild Wars 1, you might be watching this video and thinking, oh yeah, I've, I've kind of forgotten about those guys. Because, I mean, they were even slipping out of my mind at this point. So there you go, that's the den denizens, a bit of a tour of Perdition Rock. How about we go back to the Ember Light Camp now and check out what the quests are and continue the story. Alright, so I just had to swap characters here so that I could uh, actually get the primary quest. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk to the one NPC here who really has any dialogue for us at all, and that would be Shadow. So Shadow was a character that we already had met a little bit earlier on in the story. We first meet her at a place in the Maguma jungle, funnily enough, called the Henge of Denravi, uh, just before everybody gets sold out and betrayed and uh, the place gets attacked. So she has a pet called Carlotta. Uh, it's actually a spider and she references some little stories with it when you meet her again in the war in Kryta a little bit later The funny thing about Carlotta by the way, it's quite a special pet because it's a moss spider uh, I think it actually has its attributes in the war in Kryta miss uh, Attributed so it has human footprints as it wander around, but it's a moss spider and this uh, Was a real tease for people for years this little instance of it here at the Fire Island chain uh, And the reason for that is because most rangers really wanted to have a moss spider as a pet. Uh, spiders were very prestigious pets um, and you could find them in pre-searing Ascalon. That was the only place you could find them but they weren't tameable for whatever reason. They weren't tameable and yet here was Shadow and she had one. This eventually got uh, rectified or changed many years later when they added the Zaisha Menagerie update and you could finally get a moss spider by finding an egg from Nicholas the Traveler and taking it but uh, it was always one of the cool things about Carlotta. Anyway so uh, Shadow actually gives gives us basically the last quest of the game. Because after this quest, you then just go do a bunch of missions off on the Fire Island chain. As you can see here, I now don't have it unfogged. And from that point on, you've completed everything. This is the final chapter. So this is the last primary quest. It's not as significant as it seems at first, but hey. So she says, uh, since Confessor Dorian's death, the white mantle is like a snake without its head. It still writhes and strangles the peoples of Tyria, but it has no eyes with which to see, no teeth with which to bite. Unfortunately, they still have their so-called unseen masters to assist them. Members of the white mantle's inner council are meeting with the Masat in secret or so they think. We need to get in there and take out all three members of the inner council. Do you think you can handle it? So I absolutely think these three inner council members and their, their ultimate demise here at the hands of us uh, could be referenced in Guild Wars 2. This uh, suggests, by the way, that this is the end of the White Mantle. Once we do this, we finally kill the last of them and we're all done. But really, it's not because, as we know, the war in Kryta happens later and the White Mantle even survives through that to 250 years off in the future. So by no means is it the end of the story as this quest seems to be setting up. All right, so on this character, my composition is much weaker. So what should be really fun to see is how much more deadly these enemies are, which of which I'm now far, far, far more scared of. Let's see what we got, shall we? Try and use critical haste and see what we got, what's going on. Hopefully we don't just instantly die here and get nuked out. I'm running my assassin as well, which is pretty squishy, generally speaking. But hey, that was fairly comfortable. That wasn't so bad. All right, so we're actually going to come out this way. Now, you're going to see a structure in a second associated with the white mantle. Here you go. And the Massart specifically. Um, that I'm not going to talk about just yet. That'll be in the next video, but I believe what we're seeing here, you see that kind of like obsidian jade looking stuff? Uh, I believe that that's actually appeared in some of the trailers already. So that should be pretty interesting to talk about when we get to it. Uh, they're called ether seals. And you'll see flanked on the left, we've got a couple of jade bows and flanked on the right. Again, we have a couple of jade bows. I'm going to try and not aggro any of those and just charge straight into the middle here. 
And our goal is on the other side. So here we get regular White Mantle. I find it interesting, the idea that White Mantle are here. The only way we got here was going through that portal, right? So it does seem quite suspect that the White Mantle went through it as well at some point. Like, why? These are just the most high ranking of their people. It's funny, these guys are still only level 16. It's like they don't level after you first start fighting them way back in the Maguma jungle. But then there are more difficult variants of them, like these priests and things, for example, over here. So moving on just a little bit further, basically our goal here is we're going to be going to a dock where there's actually, uh, I believe the only example of an NPC who was living here on the Fire Island chain and not really having to worry. Here's a funny moment by the way, we've got White Mantle standing around with Drake and the Drake aren't attacking them. You might think, oh that's just because whatever. Well usually in Guild Wars 1, enemies would have various factions and they'd fight each other. Oh my god, I blew myself up with M50 there. And they would actually fight each other appropriately. Uh, the curious thing about this is the White Mantle actually end up learning how to tame the Drakes come the uh, War in Kryta. And in Guild Wars 2, basically all Rangers know how to tame Drakes. But it seems like it's kind of one of those things in my head canon anyway. This is definitely not, you know, something real. But uh, I always kind of like to think that it was the White Mantle who pioneered the taming of Drakes. Uh, Shadow, who we met back at the Fire Island chain entry pa place, the uh, Emberlight Camp, uh, she even points out uh, in the Warring Cryer that she admires the fact that they've learned how to tame drakes. She thinks that they've been getting fed Murgoyle meat, I believe it is. Oh, here's a couple of other enemies as well. Wind Riders. We already know about these in Guild Wars 2. These, these ones are Breeze Keeper variants, very spiky. They look really badass. They're probably the coolest ver versions of them. Very big as well. I mean, really look at the scale here. They're massive. Um, taller than a Norn, probably, this thing. Uh, but really, there's not too much more lore here. As we know from Guild Wars 2, hopefully... Uh, we should remember that they are tend to be in places that are close to the mist, so have a lot of high magical energy and things. And well, that seems to make sense here. All right, so here we go. We can see the inner council there. You've got Cuthberth, Argyle, and Bolivar. So any of those guys could get referenced. I wouldn't be surprised to hear that they may have been referenced already at some point in Guild Wars 2, but I don't think that's necessarily true. So we're just going to try and cut off all their reinforcements and things before we actually go for anyone else. So they're killing a knight. I'll let them do that. Okay. Uh, now, I will point out there's a little bonus thing you can do here. So the, the council members are up there, right? There is a slight thing you can do where there is an NPC here. He's called Captain Grumby. He's a reference. If you speak to him early before you're supposed to, he says, whoa, I'm scared. It's just a, a bit of a little joke thing. I don't think the devs really thought that you were going to see. Um, but yeah, so we're going to kill the inner council members. I have complete faith in my composition. This guy can't even get past my minions, so that's a thing. This guy up here is a Mesmer, and again seems to be struggling, surrounded by minions. Oh, it's like we're in uh, high-level fractals, hey guys? And there you go! Uh, so once they've been cut off, no dialogue really to suggest anything. I don't believe we've missed any dialogue at all. Let's have a quick look, scroll up. Nope. Except the fact that Gwen's not wielding a weapon. And now Grumby will speak to us. So Grumby is the only example of a regular dude who's just been hanging out on the Fire Island chain. And he's very similar to something we've seen in Guild Wars 2. So he says, Ahoy there, I'm Captain Grumby. Not that I'm proud of it, but the mantle pay the coin to keep my mouth shut and my boat docked. Unless they say otherwise, what can I help you with? So this, if you guys remember in Wing 2, uh, sorry, Wing 3 of the raid... We actually hear about some guys who, uh, some seafarers at that, who have been getting paid by the White Mantle to move supplies and things around. That's just like Captain Grumby here. He says, what can I help you with? Well, we just slaughtered all of the Inner Council. And he says, I'm impressed. You destroyed the Inner Council like you were swatting a fly. Your bravery inspires me. I'll accept no more of the Mantle's coin. And that, guys, is the only quest on the Fire Island chain. Once you hit Take Me to the Ring of Fire Island chain, you begin the final three missions of the story. He says, um... Uh, we say, take us over there. He says, I couldn't. They would burn my home and stuff my spirit in one of those evil statues. So there he's referring to the soul batteries. We'll talk more about very, very soon. He says, help us and we'll make sure you aren't harmed. And he says, well, you did just kill all three of the inner council without so much as breaking a sweat. You've changed my mind. I'll serve the white mantle no longer. Let me know when you want to go. We say, we're ready. That takes us to the Ring of Fire, guys. So join me next time where I'll look at the three missions on the Fire Island chain. That will come with an awful lot of cutscenes, the concluding moments of everything we got to experience here in Guild Wars 1, lots more outpost descriptions and fun stuff like that, and our little tour here will be done. So I hope you guys got a little bit of insight from that here, and I will see you for the final assault on the Massar next time. It won't be long now. Not long at all. the 
the speculation and hype for the idea of the Fire Island chain was increasing because of current events. Current events I haven't talked about on the channel, but there was an NPC who started in Frostgorge Sound and slowly over the days has been moving in a southwesterly direction, seemingly headed straight for the Fire Island chain. And right on the back of this came confirmation that was happening. So 